Welcome to Von Park. I'm Sarah Geidlinger. And I'm Marshall Ward. And today we have Jojo Worthington. I just love Jojo's dreamy atmospheric music and I've uh, been really excited to uh, have this opportunity to talk to her tonight. We talked with Jojo about her recent move to Montreal from the KW area, also about her songwriting and her producing and recording. We really geek out on some of that stuff. Jojo's also performing three songs for us and we're really excited to share those with you. Okay, let's hear them. Welcome to Bond Park. Welcome, Welcome to, to Bond Park. Park. Welcome to Bond Park. Welcome to Bond Park. Welcome to Bond Park. <laughs> Bond Park is supported by the St. Jacob's Farmer's Market. The market is a community landmark of more than half a century and is the largest agricultural market in Canada. Whatever you crave, you'll find it there. Whether it's country classics like fresh apple fritters, cinnamon rolls, and Oktoberfest sausage on a bun. And the market also has a world of flavors to explore with Korean, Vietnamese, Egyptian, Haitian, and Mediterranean cuisines, among others. Want to cook at home? The market has fresh fruits and vegetables, quality meats and seafood, locally made cheeses and preserves, and oils and honey. Many of the food vendors offer pre-made frozen options that you can save for those busy nights where you want a healthy homemade meal but are short on time. The St. Jacob's Market remains open during lockdown with extensive safety precautions in place. Open Thursdays and Saturdays from 7 a.m. to 3.30 p.m. There are over 60 food vendors on site working hard to continue to supply you and your family with fresh and local products. And here's a word from Justina. I love going to the market with my family on Saturdays. Follow St. Jacob's Farmer's Market on Facebook, Instagram, and at stjacobsmarket.com. We are supported by Eco Cremation and Burial Services, Inc., your most natural, earth-friendly option. Eco is proud to be one of Ontario's leading funeral establishments, specializing in green and natural burial, where loved ones are returned to the earth with minimal impact on the environment. These greener and more natural measures include biodegradable casket options, handmade burial shrouds, and other natural materials. Eco can help you find cemeteries that offer burials with no burial vault, or in some cases, no casket at all. Eco is an independently owned, fully licensed cremation and burial service provider. They help families celebrate lives with unique offerings and venues tailored to you and your family, regardless of your culture, religion, language, or beliefs. For local contact information and information in your community, visit ecofuneral.ca. We are supported by Culturune Market, a cultural gift shop located in the village of St. Jacob's. At Culturune Market, every gift has a story. Whether it's a beautiful Cambodian blanket or a handbag made by an indigenous Colombian family, you can learn the story of every unique item at Culturune. How about a yak wool poncho from Nepal that is warm and stylish? Yak wool doesn't itch. Culturune supports fair trade and other ethical business practices to support the artists and craftspeople who create the unique gifts. If you're looking for a gift for that hard-to-buy-for friend or family member, get them something truly unique at Culturune. Shop with your creativity and conscience at Culturune. With every gift you find, you'll also uncover a story. Check them out online at culturunmarket.com or follow them on Instagram and Facebook. Culturun is currently offering free curbside pickup Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays from noon to 4 p.m. Hey, I'm Jojo Worthington, and this is my song, Synchronize. <laughs>
This song is called Stabilize. Jojo, thank you so much for joining us on Bun Park. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's great. <laughs> um, we usually start the podcast by asking how one of us met you, but you were brave enough to answer my DM on Instagram to come and talk to us. Um, we're recording remotely. <laughs> yep. <laughs> and so you're originally from Waterloo. That's right. Yeah. 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 Water- well, I grew up in Waterloo as a kid and then I moved to Kitchener. So whenever I'm asked that question, I'm always like, which side do I take? Mm -hmm. But I love both of them, uh, obviously for different reasons. But yeah, both great cities. All my friends are very confused about if it's one city or two cities. And it's great. 
Yeah. We don't normally pay attention unless you have to pay a bill or unless you happen to drive over the line. Yeah, exactly. I'm like, I never think about it because it's just like one place to me. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. Jojo, how, how would you differentiate to somebody if someone was asking you about Kitchener Waterloo? How would you, what would be the first thing you'd say about what's different between the two cities? Yeah. Well, I usually say it's two different cities, but they're the same. Yeah. And that usually is like, what? Um, and then they ask me which one I prefer, and I just say I'm from both of them. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> that is kind of a hard thing to explain when because we used to be known as the Twin Cities before we or the Tri. Then it was the Tri, and then it's the region. Mm-hmm. But it's like it's one city with an imaginary line. Yeah, and it- there are some houses that exist on the line, so you have both cities in your address. Yeah, yeah. And there are two different mayors, am I right? Yep. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's just so interesting. Like, why is it one region, but it's two cities? Why don't they just... I think one of the biggest things is there's people who live in Waterloo who are who enjoy Uptown Waterloo, yeah. who want nothing to do with downtown Kitchener. <laughs> who are those people? <laughs> and vice, <laughs> vice versa. There's people who absolutely love downtown Kitchener who just have no interest for Uptown Waterloo. Yeah. I just... I just jumped like that because I broke my pen and I scared yeah. myself. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> That's scary stuff. I think I should branch out more. And although there's so many opportunities there, but um, yeah, I just wanted to get out there more and see what else was available to me, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. And what's what's that been like? Well, you're not supposed to be na- making new friends and, <laughs> and getting out there and, and no playing shows. I'm, ass- I'm assuming that gigging is still part of what you do. And I, I know you had a tour plan for this year, which mm-hmm. probably <laughs> yeah. a <big> surprise. <laughs> yeah, I was actually supposed to tour the States for the first time with the record I released, um, I guess, two, two years, two Junes ago. Um and that's the company you keep? That's the company you keep, yeah. Um, but yeah, um, <laughs> building a community here has definitely been harder than I thought it was going to be. I do have like some good friends that already live here and uh, definitely got to network with a lot of musicians who were at the Banff Center when uh, everyone was told to go home. So that was really nice. But yeah, it's it's been hard. And uh, um, yeah, you can't really be playing shows here either so um yeah I don't really know what's going on I'm just kind of I'm just kind of here for the journey (laughs) that is I think how all of us are feeling right now Jojo (laughs) Jojo when you uh, map out a tour Mm -hmm. um what's that process like is it like I try to think about how you know you take a look at I guess maps and and these venues and stuff and you you haven't seen most of these venues you don't know a lot about them but how do you how do you build a tour basically from scratch yeah that's so funny yeah you don't really get to see these venues you kind of just hope from like hearing people's good word about it that they're okay Um, I've definitely played some venues um, doing that that have not been okay and that's been a an interesting time but um, for this U.S. tour I wanted to do something differently because according to my Spotify analytics most of my fans are actually in the states which is interesting that is interesting Uh, yeah i didn't i was surprised actually but um so what i did was just kind of looked at the cities that that had the most listeners in the states and kind of drew a little map according to that um but in canada usually what i've done is just you know thought about okay, what are the cities where I've had most success and um, can I visit any new cities in between um, and kind of assess it, will it be worth it? Will I make any money there? Um, And uh, if there's any bands that I can play with that will help me bring out more people. Um, Yeah, that's kind of what I do. And then also um, if somebody asks me to play a show in a certain city I'll kind of just um figure out something to to work along or work around that so yeah Mm -hmm. (laughs) yeah maybe I'm I'm a huge fan of the Grapes of Wrath and you got to I guess open for them oh yeah Yeah. I'm a huge fan of the Grapes of Wrath so where was that and how was that yeah that was at um Home County Music Festival in London Ontario 
And yeah, I just got to perform before they went on the main stage, which was pretty fun. What a dream. Uh, it was super quick. I did not get to speak to any of them. <laughs> but what a bunch of jerks. Was- no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Yeah, it was just like very quick, like whoop, whoop. so. Yeah, but that's my claim to fame, you know. I got to open for them. Didn't talk to one of them, but you know. You <laughs> had was another. It. You had another fun detail. I know you were just talking about um, writing for, for movies and for video games, which sounds incredibly exciting. But one of your songs was actually featured on one of the um, uh, the new imaginings of Degrassi. Was it Degrassi Next Class? <laughs> I was reading that online. I'm like, what a cool Canadian fun fact to have in your realm of things that you've accomplished. Yeah, I I do love that it is Canadian and that it's on there. (laughs) Yeah, I don't, I honestly, like, I haven't watched the show, like, since maybe I was, like, in grade school, but um, I do love that it's on there and it's Canadian and Drake was on it. So that's right. Yeah. We w- I would have watched the original one with Joey Jeremiah and Spike and all those Christine. Yeah. Yeah. Those are good years. <laughs> <laughs> Jojo, your, your, your music is so sophisticated in the recording and so well produced. What, when you first started out, what did it, what did that look like in the very early stage when you were trying to write music before you had like all these layers to work with and this, this big soundscape to kind of build on? <laughs> Um, well, thank you so much. Um, yeah, I started writing songs when I was about 14 and I started on guitar. So, um, I was playing in a a little high school band, but we hadn't ever recorded anything. And then I started writing songs on the ukulele and suddenly like it was, I just found it much more inspiring for some reason. I, I was writing songs a lot quicker and um yeah it just it just felt really good to play it um and yeah i i didn't really know anything about music production um back then but my school actually had a music studio course that i enrolled in and my professor said that he would help me record an album and he would produce it and that was kind of the first ever recording experience I got was in that class and working with him which was really cool and uh, yeah he taught me a lot how to use logic and uh, kind of like very basic stuff and then that helped me get a better sense of what I wanted to do with my life and then I went to to Fanshawe for audio engineering and music production. Do you remember how you yeah. felt about your voice when you first heard it? I think about how it's such an instrument. <laughs> your voice is like an instrumental part of everything else happening in there. Did it feel that way at the beginning that your your voice was very instrumental? Yeah, it's so funny because I remember when I was in choir and I was in musical theater before, um, I really hated my voice and I never got the solos. I never got the cool roles and I was always really disappointed because I thought it was because of my voice. Well, I must have been. (laughs) Um, But yeah, I I didn't like it. And then when I started writing songs, I kind of, I don't know, I think I was just picking up inspiration from other musicians that I liked. But now when I listen back to what my voice was in my earlier recordings, I'm like, oh my gosh, that sounds awful. Why did I sound like that? But maybe, I don't know if other <laughs> musicians think about that when they listen to their younger selves. But I think they do. We often talk on here about um, like the artist sketchbook, like any of your early work, it's important to recognize what it was for and mm-hmm. what it was like, because without it, you wouldn't be where you are now. Right. Yeah, yeah, it's true. Yeah, it definitely brought me somewhere. That's for sure. Do you think that the ukulele gave you, do you think it was more of a complimentary instrument for your softer, more... Like atmospheric. And, uh, yeah, atmospheric. Yeah. Like, I'm, I, I don't uh, know if you're uh, familiar uh, with the Otherworldly and... Otherworldly. And dreamy. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. um, I'm thinking of, I can't remember the lead singer's name, but the band Lush from the 90s, I was really into them. And I and I really I think of them when I hear your voice. But do you think that that instrument helped with that inspiration for letting your voice come more alive in your songwriting? Yeah, definitely. I think it was just like two soft things coming Mm -hmm. there that helped, you know, build something into something bigger. Um, 
yeah, I, I've never really honestly thought about it, but I think it, it did really compliment it. And yeah, I think it, it helped like, you know, with my creativity, which helped with my songwriting. So yeah. So speaking of songwriting, you like in 2012, you won the WPL songwriting competition. <laughs> And that's like the start of the list of your awards. And then like 35 awards later, you've got this gold medal in the Indie Pop Global Music Awards. Yeah. Right? (laughs) That's a lot of awards. That's a lot of accomplishments. Um, What was it like entering that WPL contest when you were young? I remember going to the the library with my mom and uh, I don't remember a lot of people being there. Um, (laughs) But it was it was a fun time and I'm really happy about that because it it inspired me to keep going and, and to keep writing songs. So. Mm-hmm. so I was just listening to the song, The Company You Keep. And what a drastic difference from the earlier stuff, right? So you've got it all sort of. You've got these these simple folk ballads, but the, the songwriting is tight, actually. I would say that those songs have like no fat on them. They're just like... <laughs> The lyrics are a little bit mind-blowing. We were watching your videos. Me and my family were watching your videos on YouTube with the the spinning lyrics in the middle. That series of videos, wonderful way to visualize those lyrics. Um, And then you've got these layered texture songs that have so much ambient sonic levels to them, right? Um, And that's such a beautiful layer to put your voice on top of. But then the company you keep has that like train beat going through it. It's what I call the ruby sound. Um, This is old. Kenny Rogers had a okay. song called Ruby. It's terrible. If you people listen to it, it's, um, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's a beautiful song. I love it. It gets stuck in my head all the time. But gosh darn it, those lyrics do not fly in 2020. That's for sure. Um, but it's got that sort of train rhythm through the whole thing. And again, that's it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful um, base to layer your voice on top of and get the rest of that song across. And then parts of the song remind me of the band Mates of State. I don't know if you've listened to any of that before. But it's just... <laughs> It's like a constant, solid vocal, but the melody still keeps your attention. Yeah, it's like tempos rise and fall. Yeah, they do, like, but yeah. but yet it's still with that train beat underneath. I'm probably not using the proper terminology. Yeah. You've gone to school for it, and you can <laughs> you can definitely explain it to us. But it just it just keeps you going the whole time. Yeah, yeah. It's a bit of an anthem too. It sounds like a like a pop rock <laughs> anthem to me. What was that song about? How did you get to writing it? What do you call that style? I don't know. Tell us all your things. <laughs> yeah. For So when I was writing The Company You Keep, I yeah, I was really thinking about like, yeah, stadium rock, mm-hmm. stadium art, and just like really, um, yeah, having having something catchy and then very like rhyth- rhythmic based. And I'm really inspired by LCD sound system. Oh, yeah. And they do the same thing where it's like the same rhythm is just like constantly going and then it evolves and there's layers. And I really love that. And uh, I really love that about um, the composer Steve Reich as well. Mm -hmm. Um, Just like constant rhythms that, you know, yeah, they kind of are constant throughout the same thing and having the rhythm as like the foundation of the song. Um, so yeah, I was, I was thinking about that and I really love how when that is the case, um, bass wise, you don't really need like, you know, a crazy bass line. Like the bass kind of helps ground everything when, you know, everything's kind of floating with this rhythm and then the bass like really grounds it Mm -hmm. and it's not really moving that much, like maybe a couple notes, but it stays pretty uh, constant as well. And it's like you're on the track with that train in country music. It would have been like, I'm talking about, it would have been that. Tick, 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 yeah. Tick, tick, oh yeah. Oh, but yeah. it's so different now, right? Like ghost riders <laughs> in the sky. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So um, yeah, I was just really inspired by that and just want to make a freaking cool record that I liked (laughs) and that you were going to tour this year yeah (laughs) yeah yeah. something a little more dancey too because I sometimes I I do get um a little self-cautious that like maybe my music is too sad um because when I I just write songs when I'm 
when I'm sad and when I'm happy, you know, I go, I don't really write songs. I, I go on a hike and I mm-hmm. eat ice cream or something. So, right. yeah. <laughs> but so I kind of, I think I was in that moment when I was writing those songs, I was feeling like I should have something a little bit more dancey maybe for people. And um, I was really happy with what happened because I think it's still very true to myself. And um, it's weird that um, my first thought was like, you know, to please people and to right. do, <laughs> do something like that. But um, I think the album's really true to myself and I, I, I love it and I'm really proud of it. So I don't, I don't think there's anything wrong with writing something to please people. I remember listening to um, a podcast called Song Exploder. It's one of my favorites. I've talked to Marshall about it before. Where yeah, they break. Have it. you heard that one? Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. So um, it was St. Vincent was talking about mm-hmm. the song New York uh, off of mm-hmm. that last album, Mass Seduction, I think it's called. And it's so beautiful. New York is in New York without you. Oh, love it so much. And um, she was saying like halfway through writing that song, it hit her. She's like, holy shit, this might be somebody's favorite song. I think I'm <laughs> nailing it here. And that's kind of what inspired her to, to keep moving forward with it. Yeah. I don't think mm-hmm. there's anything wrong with that because sometimes you just hit that magic spot and keep running, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And it, it comes from an honest place too, like uh, an invulnerable place. Like, okay, this is what why I'm writing the song and... Yeah, I I love St. Vincent. Like mm. she was the one of the biggest inspirations to me like in high school and throughout college and I just love that she was just ripping guitar and she's a woman and just like doing everything and mm-hmm. being amazing. So, yeah, I love her and I I love that podcast so much. Too. Oh gosh, I know I I haven't seen a new episode in a long time, but um whenever it I just eat it up. I don't care what the content is. I'll listen to whoever they've got on there. The way that they bust apart the songs and then, you know, like echo them out, like it's already happened and now let's move on. Oh, it's so beautiful. (laughs) In your songwriting process, Jojo, uh, where are you writing the lyrics? Is that coming later or are there times where you actually start off sitting down and writing lyrics before you write any instrumentation? Yeah, it kind of happens everywhere in a big jumbled mess of everything. yeah, sometimes I write the lyrics before and there's no music. I'm just like, I just have like a massive folder in my notes app on my phone. And <laughs> it's just like a million lyrics from like, yeah, all the way back from like 2012. Um, and I'll just like write down things that, you know, I think about or just meditate on and I'll just write those down. And then, um Sometimes when I'm just like playing a chord progression and I like where it's going, I'll just kind of like mumble some something and not even like audible words, but, and then just like the way that, that, you know, weird noise that I make (laughs) sounds kind of forms the word that I choose. And I'll just kind of run with that and try to form something around a jarbled mess. Um, I've seen, did you see Taylor Swift's documentary on Netflix? She does that. And then I just recently watched the Blackpink, you know, the K-pop group Blackpink. I watched their documentary and they do that also for songwriting. So I think there's, I think there's some real merit to it. A lot of people do that. Yeah. And uh, I don't know how it and why it happens that way, but I think something in like the the subconscious, like forms the words, already knows the words that you're going to be writing and uh, that you just opening your mouth allows for that to become real. Um, but it's very interesting how it, how everyone, you know, has a little bit of a difference or is the same. And yeah, songwriting is a weird thing. <laughs> I think there must be a lot of bravery in that. Like the first time you record yourself just going, Hello, da, 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 do, you know, like without actually <laughs> saying, is there a little bit of cringiness in there where you're like, what am I doing? And then you get, it becomes part of your process that you become proud of later. Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Anyone, I don't want anyone to ever listen to my, my little <laughs> memo recordings ever. <laughs> you have to save it all for your documentary one day. Oh yeah. They're like, they're like nudes. Like they're yeah. so 
<laughs> vulnerable. Like <laughs> no one should ever listen to that. They ever. might be worse than nudes. Like, right? Like I just, I, I mean, uh, <laughs> I mean that with love, right? It's just so vulnerable <laughs> and so private. Exactly. And yeah. raw. I think raw is the word I'm looking for. Mm-hmm. Having said that, uh, Canadian songwriter Jan Arden once uh, I got to interview her, and yeah. she, she wrote a song called "Make It Christmas Day," which she wrote when she was 18. Mm-hmm. I think it's the most beautiful Christmas song. And she said, "It's because it's so pure." And she didn't have any voices in her head when she wrote it. Mm. Basically, the next year she had a record, and all of a sudden there's all these things to consider and and people and and opinions and and producers and she -hmm. said it's unfortunate you don't realize it but what it's gone forever once you're kind of now being surrounded by people and thinking about your audience Mm -hmm. and you'll you'll never be that pure again (laughs) wow (laughs) it's okay don't worry (laughs) you'll still write good stuff (laughs) jojo what what was the atmosphere like at fanshawe college as being as a student what what's that like being among all these other aspiring musicians yeah yeah. uh it was amazing like i loved every experience there um it's very competitive for sure um we had like a little billboard uh magazine like top 10 poster we'd put out every week or something about like you know how many followers did you get this week how many tracks did you write? How many tracks did you release? And then, um, yeah, different bands would be like in the top 10. And that was like super competitive. It was like a healthy competition, I think, most, hopefully most of the time. But um, yeah, and just like, you know, it was, yeah, you, you had to work really hard because, um your studio shifts would sometimes be like from 3 a.m. to 6 a.m. and then you would have 8 a.m. class and then, you know, have all these rehearsals um, the following day. And I remember once I didn't sleep for like 48 hours and I had three rehearsals um, and I was, I just went home and I was like, okay, I'm just gonna nap for like two hours, that's all. And then I'm gonna, do all these rehearsals and then I can finally sleep. And I remember going to bed, I set like maybe like 10 alarms just to make sure I was gonna wake up. And I never did. And I woke up the next day with like a million missed calls (laughs) and apparently I had slept for 16 hours. Your body was telling you you needed it. (laughs) And yeah, it was just hilarious because like, oh my gosh, like, but I loved Fanshawe so much. I got to meet so many people that I still work with. So yeah, it was a very positive environment. Yeah. So it sounds like were they pushing, um, so you're learning theory, you're learning recording, you're learning reproducing, you're, you're working mm-hmm. on actual songs, actual music, you're writing, <laughs> but you're learning business also. You're getting yourself out there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, artist management an artist business was definitely a big part of it as well as entertainment law. Uh, so they try to teach you everything. Yeah. In those two years. That's amazing because there's lots of like art programs that are missing that component. Totally. Like they just kind of send you off into the yeah. world and go, go sell what you yeah, know how to make. There's, there's yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. I'm really happy. I did do that one. Cause I was thinking about another program that was only one year and, uh, yeah, wouldn't have taught me all that stuff. And I I am very grateful for that because, yeah, taught me a lot of important things that are maybe more even important than, you know, the music itself sometimes just because, like, you got to know how to, you know, do business sometimes. and How to and take care of yourself out there. How to, yeah, how to take care of yourself and, and make sure you're not getting screwed and um, not taking – not being taken advantage of so yeah and how much control do you have in your when you make a music video are you is it a collaborative effort where you're you convey ideas and say this is how i would like to come across and this is how i would like to look and this is how i would like this to make sense with the music video we've all seen music videos that the music doesn't gel well with the no but yours are like short films they're they're beautiful (laughs) thanks how does that how does that all work yeah uh i just worked with really nice people um (laughs) and yeah because 
I'm, you know, usually on a low budget. Um, I'm doing like all my own styling and um, all my own makeup and, and stuff like that. So I'm glad to have control over what I look like. Um, yeah, I, fe- I think I would feel weird if somebody told me I needed to look differently or something. Um, but yeah, I've, I worked with uh, Ed Platero on uh, the Stabilize music video, and that was so much fun. And honestly, I, I didn't really have uh, any idea like what it was going to look like and what it should look like. That was, that was all him, basically, and all his vision. So he really brought that to life. And same with the Small Encounters music video. <laughs> Um, uh, my friend Connery Ballantyne directed that and that was his visual concept as well and yeah we we all just kind of worked together on that and yeah it was a lot of fun do I you, had so much fun do you remember what the first videos you ever saw were like uh, you grew up in an era where music videos had already been around for a long time and uh, but I mean you must have seen videos by Burek where you thought oh I love the, the mystique and uh, atmosphere yeah. of these, these videos yeah, well, I I grew up watching like much music and MTV, and that's like all music videos, or it was then. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, um, I think th- I can't even think of the very first one, but I want to say it was Bow Wow, something by Bow Wow. And uh, I don't think I really understood what was even happening on the TV screen just because I was so young, but um, knowing that it was music and there was a video happening. (laughs) But I remember Bjork said something really cool um, about music videos and why they're so important to her. Um, And she said something like, when you are looking at something and hearing it at the same time, um, I think in your brain, you're able to memorize that much better than if you just audibly heard it. And for her i think when you're when you just like sometimes when you just listen to music it can take a while to kind of warm up to and kind of figure out like okay do i like this do i not like this and kind of like figure out how you feel about it but when you're you're watching it and hearing it um i think that connecting that connection like happens much quicker for people um that probably has some science thing with the brain <laughs> in there, but I thought that was really cool. And I think that's why she does so many music videos that are so beautiful and so elaborate. Uh, so I thought that was really interesting to hear. So the stabilized video, um, where was that shot? I mean, we, me and my kids were, were watching this. My daughter Justine and I were watching this and we were just mesmerized by the amount of detail in each room and the amount of care taken for your outfits. And we even like the the texture of your makeup like we were obsessed with it of course we're listening to the music at the same time but where was that shot and and did you have direction over that also yeah so that was at the tannery in kitchener in um kristen waterworth's um art studio and so she uh kristen waterworth is a an artist from kitchener and she does amazing work all over town all over ontario um so she painted all the backdrops and kind of made all those rooms just with her paint. And it was crazy watching her work because she was literally doing it as we filmed. Um, And she just does it so fast. Like she's so brilliant that way. So yeah, we, we kind of like Ed and her worked together to kind of figure out the vision and, and how it was all going to look. And then uh, I mean, before, you know, filming, I kind of said like I do want it to be like kind of like monochromatic and in one color and then Ed just like took that and exploded that idea and made it what it is so yeah both of them are are brilliant and that's really where the whole (laughs) vision for the music video came from. It's absolutely Mm -hmm. gorgeous we were mesmerized. So you're also a Region of Waterloo Arts Fund grantee for one of your videos. Tell us about that experience. Yeah, so that was for Small Encounters, and that was awesome because I really wanted to include as many businesses as possible. So we filmed it at Brixton Social, which is a a nightclub on University Ave. 
And uh, yeah, <laughs> it, was, it was funny, like being in this bar, like this empty bar um, during the day. <laughs> um, and then we, I wanted um, White Tiger Vintage to also be involved. So they- So pretty in there. Oh yeah, they may, I love that store so much. Uh, so they provided all the costumes, which was great for the myself and the women that were in the music video. And uh, who else did we have? Neurita Arts was a big part of it. They gave me a donation and uh, Seven Shores did the, the backstage catering, which was awesome. And uh, yeah, and then we filmed the church part at St. Matthew's Lutheran Church in Kitchener. Yeah. That's wonderful. <laughs> so, Joe, Sorry, did I answer it, your question? You or? did. You completely answered the question. <laughs> when it comes to uh, your live show, how do you put your set list together? I've always been really fascinated by how a, a set list is built. You know, I think the number three slot always seems to be a really important one in a live show. And uh, Oh, yeah. And uh, so how do, you, how do you build your set list to make your uh, live performance as cohesive and as possible? Yeah, wow. I haven't thought of a set list in so long. Well, if you were, if you were going to build one today, how would you do it? <laughs> oh my gosh, it's crazy. A set list. I almost forgot what it was. Oh, so. <laughs> so sad. <laughs> I know. Oh man. Um, okay, set list. Wow. Um, usually when I've done it, I'm <laughs> like, well, usually when, I, when I've done it in the past, um, I try to start out with something that can kind of like ease the the listener in. Um, I think intros are really important, and especially in a in a live setting. So that's why I, uh, at least recently on, since I've released the company you keep, I usually start with a company and argument together, and uh, yeah, I think that's like a good ease into the song and then it it picks up and the beat comes in and then you can kind of get into it um and then <laughs> yeah i guess like something else that's kind of more dancey usually um i really love transitions as well intros and transitions and live sets i think are everything um i very rarely will just like stop playing and you know wait for applause I really love when this the set can just be constant music and um and then at the very end there's applause because I I really don't like speaking um (laughs) that much during my shows because I'm not you know very good at uh just rambling around so try to do the music do that for me Mm -hmm. um and then yeah, usually like something maybe softer in the middle since most of my music is kind of softer. And then at the end, I'll end with something dancey again, uh, just to be more, you know, memorable or get people remembering that. So and kind of end on a fun high note. Yeah. Mm-hmm. End on a fun high note, <laughs> always. <laughs> What, what, yeah. what are some of your most memorable concerts that you've seen yourself, like that you've gone to a good of other artists? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Who, have you, who have you seen live? Oh, yeah. Um, well, I'll never forget seeing LCD Sound System live. Uh, I got to see them at Way Home um, a couple of years ago. And yeah, that was just a fantastic light show, crazy concert. Um I've I've gone to uh, this festival in Eau Claire's, Wisconsin, for the past couple years. Called uh, yeah, it's called Eau Claire's, and that's run by um, uh, oh my gosh, <laughs> uh, Bon Iver and Aaron Desner from the National, mm-hmm. and that's an amazing concert. Um, Moses Sumney, Serpent with Feet, John Prine, Paul Simon. Um, just like, you know, huge inspirations to me. Um, I haven't yet seen Bjork live or Radiohead. And those are like big, big inspirations for me. 
Um, but my favorite concert was probably Sufjan Stevens. And uh, I drove to New York with some friends and we saw him live and it was amazing. And how did yeah. you get introduced to the music of John Prine? Because I actually only in the last year have discovered John Prine. I, it just was never on my radar. How, how I, <laughs> that beautiful song, um, Speed of the Sound of Loneliness. Mm -hmm. But anyways, I, I just, for whatever reason, didn't really know this music. How did you discover John Prine? Yeah, honestly, I hadn't really either. Um, my dad was really into him and my dad, he loves oldies and he would mention him, but um, it was actually at that Eau Claire's um, festival that I saw him for the first time. And it was actually insane because as soon as he started playing, there was a huge thunderstorm and uh, he was just playing during this crazy thunderstorm. And it was so fitting um, to see him up there. And yeah, it's so, I'm so sad that he passed because uh, that's, that was like definitely a very, very memorable concert that I'll, yeah, I'll never forget that one. Do you think that you had one of those audio visual connections because the thunderstorm was happening while he was performing? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, I'm, and also because the rain. Mm -hmm. So I was feeling, I was hearing and everything. <laughs> Yeah. What's your earliest music memory? I'm going to hit you with this one. Like, what's, oh what What was the moment when you were like, this is me. This is this is what <laughs> I'm going to do. It had to be before you started writing songs at 14. I can't, I can't really say, like, if there was a moment in my life where I just was like, yeah, I'm going to be a musician. This is what I'm going to do. I kind of feel like it it was always gonna just like something was just like always gonna happen um, that I didn't really have any control of maybe. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I used to wanna be a pastry chef at one point and, and other things, but um, I can't really say there was like a decision where I, I made like, I'm gonna do this instead. Uh, Cause music has just always been there and um, yeah, I think the first like music memory and maybe like my first music love was probably the Beatles. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember when I was really young, uh, nobody was home one day and I was just in the house by myself. And um, I asked my brothers to put on this Beatles record before they, le they left. And I was just like, yeah, singing to like eight days a week and... <laughs> hard days and I was just like singing in the house by myself and for some reason I just like remember that so vividly um and yeah I don't really know why or how I was left alone in the house at such a young <laughs> age but it just happened and yeah I just remember that so pro yeah I guess the Beatles maybe a lot of people say that though the Beatles was know. definitely my first love and yeah. again like I'm old but I'm not I'm still too young to have the Beatles as my first love right that's something people always go back to it wasn't contemporary at the time obviously but yeah. there is something so special and um something so important about that first time you're left home alone and you get to turn up your your music as loud as you want that's a lasting yeah. memory for sure yeah, exactly. Yeah. I remember the first time I heard surf music and I was like, Oh yeah. What is this? You yeah. know? And uh, uh, yeah. I've just recently when found out in the it? last year that, that that surf sound is thicker guitar strings. Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. Jojo, uh, how are you feeling about being in Montreal? Is there other times where you feel like a bit of an outsider when you're there or does it feel like a community that kind of welcomed you as soon as you arrived? Again, we're talking about it pretty strange times where we're in right now though <laughs> nobody's just hugging you in the street telling you to have a good day these days yeah um yeah well I like I said like I did I do have like some great friends here that have definitely like been showing me around and and teaching me stuff but it is hard especially in a a place where you don't speak the same language and I'm learning French but it's uh it's been hard sometimes um when because there are people that don't speak English here and uh that's totally cool I just have to learn French <laughs> <laughs> um so that has been a little bit hard and 
but I'm I'm doing fine. I'm doing well, and yeah, I, I'm I'm really looking forward to when things open up because I know it'll be amazing here, and going to concerts will be amazing. I'm I'm really looking forward to that. So, Jojo, yeah. what do you know about the music scene in Montreal? What I mean is, if you were a visual artist and walked around old Montreal, mm-hmm. you could quickly get a sense looking in the galleries what the art scene looks like in in Montreal somewhat. Mm-hmm. But uh, as, as a musician, though, how do you get a sense of what a city's music scene looks like when you've only been there for a while? Yeah, that's interesting. Um, there's usually festivals and open air things happening and none of that right. is going on right now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, uh, I I do have a co- like, I know some bands here and I... You know, I've been to Montreal several times before I'm moving and um, kind of got a good sense of it. Um, but there's, I know there's so much more music that I, I don't even know about and so many more scenes that I don't even know about. Um, you know, I, ha- I haven't even, I don't know anything about the French music scene here, really. And I would love to know more about that because I know that's huge. And the jazz also, right? Oh, and, and the death metal scene. Oh yeah, <laughs> every place has theirs. No, Montreal really yeah. has a good death metal oh, scene. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'm kind of just in like I just know like a few people in the folk and like um, you know experimental um, alternative scene, but I really don't like. There's so many genres. There's so many um, little niches I have no idea about yet. So uh, I'm re- I'm looking forward to when these concerts happen. Like. You know, I'll, I'm I'm even willing to go to open mic, mm-hmm. which you know is rare. Would never usually say that, but <laughs> I'll go to an open mic just because, like, I'm, I want to go to a concert so bad. <laughs> so, what have you been doing creatively in these months? Mm-hmm. Have you been sitting by yourself and writing songs? Yeah, yeah, doing that a lot, and also just doing engineering work and and mixing for different artists. Um, but yeah, I've been writing a new album and working on that and also learning how to play pedal steel, which has been interesting. Oh, what a beautiful sound that is. There's oh, nothing yeah. like it. And yeah, it's I love it so much. So I've never um, tried it, but am I correct in thinking it's it's loose? Like you know how it, like an electric guitar is looser to play than, a, than an acoustic? Is it is it loose and sloppy? Is it hard to keep the pedal steel sound tight or is it or is it easier? Oh. Um, well, I guess, I don't know if this is just the one that I have, but yeah, I have found it like, like the tuning is, uh, very particular mm-hmm. and, um, it does go out of tune very fast, but that might just be mine. <laughs> I don't know if that's all of them. Um, you'll find, yeah. you'll have to find the pedal steel, uh, community in Montreal and see what they say about it. <laughs> oh, where are they? Where are you? Where are my people at? Also, yeah. I don't know anything about video game music and mm-hmm. how that's produced. How is that even put it's together? A thing. Yeah. That's a great question. I've been trying to figure that out too. <laughs> that's why I moved here. <laughs> but yeah, I um I really want to get into it. I need like trying to get my foot in the door. It hasn't happened yet uh, with video games. I believe you need a different kind of digital audio workstation that I probably don't have, but um yeah, that's. I know, like, there's so many video game software companies here. So I know there's something, something out there. Uh, I just gotta meet the right people. Maybe it's like film work. I've made some documentaries, so I have an idea of how a musician will sit and watch film and put music that makes sense to the film. And if the, yes. and if the music's off, everything will seem amiss. So it has to line up with what's on screen. But maybe, maybe video games are like that too. I don't know. Yeah, like. I can't, can they be that different? I'm not sure. I just like thinking about like all the the options you have in video games where different music needs to be cued at different certain, like certain times. So I'm just thinking like there, you maybe need like a different DAW for that or something, but um, yeah, yeah. Video game people in Montreal, please find <laughs> <laughs> Look her up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I want to geek out for a second because um, you do a lot of your own production and engineering and mixing of your own music. Am I right? Yeah, production and for sure. Okay. Yeah. So, mm-hmm. And so, are you? What are you recording to? What software are you typically using? 
Yeah, so I use Pro Tools mm -hmm. a lot, uh, and then also Logic for kind of composing and arranging. Um, and then I'll I'll bring it into Pro Tools to mix it and you know record um, most of it. And uh, yeah, I kind of I kind of go back and forth between those, but I would say Pro Tools is the main one. Mm -hmm. And then are you ever what, what happens when you're sort of done? Are you sending it off to a buddy to check out, or are you? Are you bouncing it off people for ideas? What's that process like? Yeah, yeah. I'll usually send it to a couple of people and just see what they think or maybe even collaborate with them. Um, but yeah, I, I haven't actually mixed and engineered that much of my own work, which is something I really want to get into more. Um, my friend Will Cran, who um, was my co-producer on The Company You Keep, has recorded and engineered my last two records so uh, I love working with him and I think it's it's different when it's your own music like uh, like when I'm when I'm mixing other people's music I I have like total confidence but when it's my own music I think I'm like I don't know about this like and I I want someone else there to kind mm -hmm. of bounce ideas off of so we've been there we're creative people we know how sensitive we are mm. <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> oh artists i know sense. right hey as yeah. we start start to wrap up uh jojo i think about how you know you came out of fanshaw's program and you must mm -hmm. have some sense of maybe you don't of where those other students went and i think about how you carved out this amazing career for yourself already do when when a, when a class like that graduates and everybody disperses do you have some some sense of where everybody went and and the <laughs> the, the roads they took um a little bit like I'm happy that I got to stay in touch with a lot of people I went to school with and I've gotten to you know keep working with them after we graduated um I know there's a couple of people out there that totally um just went a 360 and don't even do music anymore and they're doing a completely different career which is totally cool um but yeah it is interesting to see where people go and It'd be fun to do a, a class reunion thing. I've always seen those in movies, and I, I really want to experience one. <laughs> yeah. Uh, this is my song, Small Encounters.
Hey y'all, thanks for meeting us in Bond Park. Please like, rate, and subscribe to our podcast on the platform that you're listening to. And follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Bond Park Podcast. Original music by Alan Lung. <laughs>